In this segment, I'm going to take a look at the sequence managing toolbar here on the right hand side of the workspace. And basically your sequence manager is gives you a visual of the way your design sews. And so basically if you took a look at this design, now I just created this design using creative drawings and I basically just created a star shape, gave it a um, a weave fill for the center and a satin stitch border for the outside. And you can see that here. Basically, the num the very first thing that I see, which is labeled as zero, is actually an image. It becomes like an icon of the entire design. So it shows me what my design will look like. And then the actual embroidery elements, so the first color I have is this um, light blue fill of the star. And if I click on that, it actually selects the light blue fill um, in the workspace. And then the next color we see is the dark blue outline. And same thing, if I click on that, it will switch to selecting the dark blue outline of this design. And there's a third element to the design that you don't actually see. And if I click on that, you'll notice that it highlights the center of the embroidery design here. And basically what that means is, um, when the design is finished sewing, so wherever this dark blue border completes sewing, it looks like it's, if I just nudge up, it looks like it probably finishes sewing somewhere around right here. And so that final element of the design is actually the machine returning back to the center of the embroidery hoop. So it's a return to hoop center. And so that's why there's always, whenever you create an embroidery design and then open it up in Wings Modular, you'll always have that at the end of your design, the return to hoop center, and you'll always have sort of the image uh, map that shows what the entire design looks like. And in between will be the actual embroidery objects themselves. Now, um, also found under the Sequence Manager view, we've got a Transform tab, and we've got an Object Properties tab. Now, I'm going to go ahead and click on the Transform tab, and you'll see that basically I have four different options. One of them is for alignment, one of them is for size, one of them is for rotation, and one of them is for moving. Now, I guess as an example, what I'm going to do, I'll click on the Sequence Manager, and I'm just going to select the light blue area of this design. And I'm going to come over to the Transform tab, and what we'll do is we'll move that, and so you can see here I have an X distance and a Y distance. And if I wanted to, I've typed in the number 20 here just when I was practicing. Um, I'll change that number. Let's make it 30. So I'll make the, I'm going to move the light blue fill 30 millimeters on the X axis. And when I say apply, you'll see that it moves the light blue fill over. I'm just going to click off. So here you can see that it's moved over my light blue fill, but it has not moved over my dark blue outline. And so that's an example of using the Transform tab. And now if I come over and look at the design, you can see here that it's changed in the Sequence Manager view. Um, I still have my what the design should look like, but then I have, you can see where the light blue is moved over and where the dark blue is still where it originally was. And so that's um, what I'll do maybe is I'll select on that light blue fill, come back to the Transform tab and try changing the number of the Y distance. Let's say we make it 20 millimeters and apply. And so that moved it up 20 millimeters. If I put in a negative value, so if I put in a minus 20 and apply, it'll move it back. Same thing here, if I make the zero, if I put in a minus 30, that would move it right back to where I started from. So these are um, mathematical ways that you can um, move something within your design. And I, I say that mathematically because, of course, when I have, have the light blue fill selected, I can click and drag to move it to any location that I want to visually, but not mathematically. So um, this is if you want to be specific about making some sort of an adjustment. Now, I'm going to use undo just to put that back where it was. And I'll look at some of the other tabs. So, all right, I'll go ahead and select that light blue fill again. Just by clicking on it, I can select it. And I'll choose the rotation option now. So right now it's set at zero. And if I change it to be, oh, let's say 45 degrees, and I say apply, it rotates that 45 degrees. Um, you also have the ability to click clockwise. And then it will 
make that move the opposite direction. So I can go 45 degrees counterclockwise or clockwise, or if I turn that off, it goes the opposite direction. So basically that's another way of rotating a design. Um, if I move over, the next one is for sizing. So horizontal scale and vertical scale. And I have the specific size. So specifically right now it's 45.4 by 47.1. And do I want to keep it proportional? In other words, if I change the size, let's just say we change the width and we say, no, we want it to be 80 millimeters. It proportionately changed the height to 82. And it tells me that's 176%. So if I say apply, it makes it bigger. Now the opposite, if I was to do not have proportional scaling put on, and then said, well, actually, I only want the width to be 60, it only changes the width, does not touch the height. And if I say apply, it'll basically squish the width, but leave the height exactly the way it is. So that's another way that you can adjust that. Now and again, I can use undo once, twice to put everything back to the way it was. So with proportional scaling turned on, if I select an area with that proportional scaling turned on, if I said, well, I just want to make it 20% bigger, so I'll type in 120%, and it tells me what size it's going to make it. And when I say apply, it goes ahead and makes that adjustment. Now, it's only doing this to the one color. If I say undo, so for example, if I wanted to do the whole star, outline and the fill, I could drag a box to select both um, objects. And now if I said, well, let's make it 120% bigger and say apply, it makes both the satin stitch outline and the fill 120% bigger. Um, the next one is for alignment. And really, I need to have multiple objects here to show how it works. So perhaps what I could do is just separate these two. So when I click on it, you can see it's selected that light blue fill. I'm going to move it away. So basically here, I'm even going to move away the, the dark blue outline. So here you can see the elements of the design really clearly. There's the image sort of icon that was created of what the design looked like when we brought it in. And then we have weave fill which I've moved off to the right and the satin outline which I've moved off to the right and sort of dropped down a little bit. So for example if I click on this um, light blue star and now I have the ability to align this but I, to align it I really need to have two things selected. So for example if I zoom out and then click and drag a box around both of those shapes I've selected them both. Now if I choose to align this, and let's say, um, you, basically these are like on off buttons. So we have a horizontal and vertical alignment. So right now, if I, I have horizontal, the center option clicked. If I say apply, it brought those two objects to be aligned by their center. And I'll say undo. If I chose, for example, left, and then said apply, it would align those two objects along the left hand side. And so again, I'll just say undo. Um, if I select them both again, oops, just draw a box to select them both, and say vertical, and for example, say top, and say apply, it brought them both. I'm going to say undo. I had both left and top selected. I'm going to have just top selected which will leave the left right alone and just bring them both to line up with the same top point. So you can see here where I guess if you were creating a layout and you had brought in a design and wanted to duplicate it and, and then have them all nicely aligned, you could make them all aligned um, by the vertical top, vertical center, vertical bottom, or horizontal left, horizontal center, and horizontal right. And you'll notice a lot of these have the same option and it says apply to duplicate. So basically if you've duplicated a part of your design um, and then you make a modification in one and say apply to duplicate, it will apply to the duplicate as well. Um, so yeah, and then the other thing about this um, sequence manager and the transform tab, there was a third tab and that's the object properties and basically here um, when you select on a shape, so for example, if I select on the outline, it tells me that it's a satin serial. And if I select on the blue fill, it tells me that it's a step. So 
these are basically just telling you the types of objects that um, types of stitches that could be in your objects. So yeah, that's a little bit about the the sequence manager and how it works and how to use it. In this segment, I'm going to review the edit drop-down menu. And so we'll be talking about things like undo, redo, cut, copy, paste, unselect, select, select all, invert selection, um, duplicate design, group, ungroup, join, break apart, and we'll talk about design starting and ending points. So. Yeah, um, a lot of these functions are also functions that are found on your main toolbars because they're important functions like copy and paste, undo and redo, or the select all, or invert your selection. So that's going to be where um, you'll more often find the, and use these tools. But just to go through the edit drop down menu and sure we, be sure we look at everything. So basically, what I've got here is the design of a star. And maybe what I'll do is just click on an area to select an area. And you can see here that I've selected the light blue fill, but I have not selected the dark blue outline. And perhaps to make that easy to visually see, I'll just move it over. So you can see here that I've got, um, I've selected the light blue fill, but not selected the dark blue outline. Now, why don't we look at, for example, under the edit drop down menu, we've got the invert selection. You have select all, which would select all objects. Unselect, which would unselect whatever you have selected. But the option for invert selection, if I choose that, you can see what happened now. Instead of having the light blue selected, I ended up with the dark blue selected. So basically, the way it works, whatever you have selected, will become unselected and whatever you don't have selected will become selected. Now um, remember these are also found here on the toolbar so the other options are for for example unselect that basically lets go of everything or select all that's a quick way of selecting everything in your design and remember you can always select an object just by simply clicking on that object. Um, you can either click on it here in the workspace or here in your sequence manager and whenever you select on an object, it becomes highlighted in your sequence manager and it gets outlined in your workspace. So that was the other option was to invert your selection and that's what will switch it from having um, basically whatever is selected becomes not selected and whatever is not selected becomes selected. So those are some selecting options. Um, so the other some features under the edit drop down menu, well we've got undo and redo. So right now redo is not an option and that's because um, it'll only become an option when you once you undo something so if I what undo is available so if I choose undo basically it's gonna move that fill back to wherever I had placed it because that was the last um, modification or transformation that I had made and now if I choose the edit drop down menu I could go to redo which would put it back to wherever I'd moved it to. So that's undo and redo and again you've got undo and redo on your main toolbar as well. So I'll set, I'll choose undo and it puts it back. So also under the drop down menu we've got cut, copy and paste. And those are can be very helpful for example. Um, what I'll do is I'll select just the light blue fill in this design and then here I have the same cut copy and paste. Now cut will basically remove this light blue fill from the design. I'll use that so it's now gone. But it puts it onto an imaginary clipboard. This is the clipboard of your computer and so if I say paste it puts it back in. But you'll notice what's changed about the design is the sewing sequence because originally it sewed light blue and then dark blue and what happened was when I cut the fill out of the design, it took it all out of the design sequence, put it onto that clipboard, and when I hit paste, it actually put it after the return to center, and it made it be the last object of the design. Now, of course, I could resequence that at any time by clicking and dragging to place that back where I want it to. Um, but now that I've done cut and paste, I could actually paste again. And it gives me another copy of the blue. And every time I hit paste, it gives me another copy of the object that I've put on my um, imaginary clipboard. So that's basically what happens. And the difference between cut and copy, 
So basically, why don't I choose the dark blue outline just so that I have something different here. So here I'm going to select the dark blue outline and instead of saying cut, if I just say copy, it leaves the dark blue outline as it is, but it puts it now my imaginary clipboard no longer has a light blue piece of fill, it has a dark blue outline and so if I hit paste, it adds another outline, I can move it over there. If I hit paste again, I got another one. So you can see here that I've created um, several pieces of weave fill and now I've created several satin stitch outlines by using that copy and paste feature. So that's kind of how that works. Now, also under the edit drop down menu, um, there, I found an option here called paste special and I found this uh, to be something unique I haven't come across many times and basically I couldn't find a lot to read about but um, from what I can tell what it's asking us when you paste something do you want to paste it as wings objects or an enhanced meta file and so I'm not exactly sure the application for this um, but it's something that perhaps we can learn about a little bit more going forward with the software um, but I didn't find too much in the documentation about exactly what the purpose of paste special is so going forward with the edit drop down menu we also have the options of group and ungroup and join and break apart so why don't I take a look at using those oh I've skipped one by the way duplicate design um, this is an easy one so if I just choose right now duplicate design what it actually did here you can see it looks exactly like the design that we were just working on but if I come to the window drop down menu now you can see that I actually have two designs design number untitled number five and untitled number four we were working on untitled number four but when I chose duplicate it actually went ahead and created a whole nother design that's exactly like it and this I can think of lots of great reasons why you might want to do that but just as an example if you've got a design and then you want to come in and make some modifications to it but you don't want to overwrite the original you want to keep your original design exactly the same as it is then you could just sit um, open up the design make a duplicate of it then you could save it with its own unique name and that way any edits you made to the new design wouldn't affect your original design so that's just an example of why you might want to do that so looking f down the edit drop down menu we still want to talk about group and ungroup and join and break apart so why don't we go ahead and select some things because as you can see they're gray which means whenever something's gray I can't use it unless I do something first and in this case if I wanted to group something well, why don't I go ahead and um, I'm gonna click and drag a box around the two satin outlines and you can see that two objects have now been selected so if I said edit and group now I'm gonna click off to let go of what's selected and notice now if I try and select this design this star up here as soon as I click on it both stars become selected and if I wanted to move the star both stars would move together at the same time so basically what's happened is we've made them like they're one object but really they're two objects that have been grouped together and the reason I say that is because you would also have the ability to under the edit drop down menu to choose ungroup now that I've chosen ungroup I should be able to select one star or the other star so that's one way you could say select all and then edit and then group and now I have a group of objects and I could easily select them by just clicking anywhere and if I wanted to move them they would all move together so that's the idea of group and the alternative is ungroup puts them all back uh, the final options under that edit drop down menu are join and break apart and so for example here notice um, right now this outline sews and then the next object is this outline that's the order that I had created them in and you can see here that this outline finishes sewing right there and then it runs down and it starts sewing the next object right there now if I was to and I'm just gonna click and drag a box to select those two objects and I'm going to say edit and I'm gonna say join now 
not only does it group them together so that they become uh, selectable together as a group, but notice that the starting and stopping position changed because now where the star that sows first finishes has been moved to down here so that it can become basically attached to this star down here. So that's the kind of difference between group and join is that when you join something, it actually makes the software see it like it's all one object and it changes the sewing order to connect them as well. Now, um, the alternative to that, if I select this, would be to edit, would be to break apart. So if I choose break apart, it goes back to the beginning. So now again, I can select them individually and that sewing sequence has changed back so that they're two completely separate sort of stars in that design. And there's one more thing under the edit drop down menu I should look at too, and that's the design start end point. So you have the ability to move the start point of your design, to move the end point of your design. You can move the start and end point together at the same time, or you can have your design return to the starting point. So if you chose to move your starting point, then you could after that choose to have the design return to that start point. Um, I'll do this one. Move start and end point. So it's going to move them together. And right now you can see, before I do that, um, this design starts sewing. Well, I'm not even exactly sure where it starts sewing. Let's see. This star here. So it must start somewhere right in the center of that design. Um, but you can see here that that's where the design currently, that's where the ending point of this design is. So it used to return to center to there. and But now the last piece of embroidery is sitting right there. And so if I was to say edit, start endpoint, and say uh, move, start, and end, it gives me a grid. I can see um, it basically puts a, a rectangle around my entire design. And that rectangle has a center point, both horizontally and vertically, which would actually make it very easy for me to select the center of this entire piece of embroidery. So if I choose the center with this crosshair right there, it moves the starting point and the ending point to be the same place. So now you notice that this star that sews last has a line that's returning back to the center of the design. So that's your ability to make a a change to the starting point and the ending point of your design. Um, yeah, so that's the edit drop down menu and a quick review of all of the features found under the edit drop down menu. In this segment, we're going to take a look at the options under the view drop down menu, and that's found here on the top toolbar. So when I click on the view drop down menu, we see options like 3D preview. Um, grid options, guidelines, crosshair, setting your light source, changing your fabric, and your backdrop properties. So I'll go ahead and take a look at those different options. Basically, I have 3D Preview turned on right now, and if I click on this again, it'll turn it off. And perhaps what I could do is just zoom in a little more closely, and then um, when I turn it back on, View, Preview 3D, you can see here that it's got quite a... Um, a realistic appearance to it. It basically takes all your computer lines that were there and gives them some thickness and darkens them up so that you can see them. And also under that view drop down menu you've got the option to set the light source. And when I use this, basically I'll just move it over here, um, you have the ability to choose where the light source is going to be. And if I go ahead and try and change the light source by just clicking, you'll see the difference here in the design. So every time I click on a different place for the light source, it gives a different appearance to that. And so it's sort of your ability to customize, I guess, the, the way that your design looks in the 3D preview. You also have an intensity, I guess like a slider that you could dark, take this down and, and you can see it darkens up the design, um, bring it back up and it just brightens it again. So if you find some settings that you really like in your um, light source adjustment, you can save those as your default settings and that way all, you know, all of your designs will be displayed like that. You also have the ability to reset back to the factory defaults and if you want you can just simply say cancel and not make any changes at all. 
So that's the light source and the 3D preview. Now also found under the view drop down menu, we've got the toggle grid, which basically will turn on my grid. And then um, you'll notice that if I zoom in, so if I zoom out, we just simply see the, the main grid lines, which are set at every 10 millimeters. But if I zoom in closely, you'll see that there's actually smaller grid lines. And so I have a main grid line every 10 millimeters, and I have a smaller grid line every 1 millimeter. And under the view drop down menu, we've got our grid options. And so we can actually change that. In other words, if I wanted to, I could. Um, so right now, my my X and my Y units are set at one millimeters. Well, if I change this to two millimeters, I would end up with a grid that was had an X line every two millimeters, but a Y line every one. So I'll say okay, and you can see here, if I get even closer, that I have my X grid is every two millimeters, but my Y grid is every one millimeter. And so that's how you can adjust that under the view drop down menu, grid options. If you wanted to, you could set this at five millimeters and set them both at five millimeters and you'll get a, a five millimeter square. So it's really up to you to decide, you know, what would work good for you in terms of a size of a grid that would help you to, you know, understand the size of your embroidery as we zoom in and zoom out. Also under the view drop down menu, we have the ability to talk about, um, editing our guidelines. Now, I currently don't have any guidelines in this design, and so what I'm going to do is I'll just close this window for a minute, and perhaps I'll even turn off my grid just so that we don't aren't confused by the two, and I'm going to zoom out. So let's just imagine you wanted to create uh, more than one star and you wanted to align them. Um, to create a guideline, what I need to do, this is the ruler, if I click on the ruler and drag down into the workspace, I create a guideline and I can place this wherever I want. So when I let go, it sets that guideline and I can make as many guidelines as I'd like to make. So maybe I'd like to make, um, I could use this to set the size. By the way, once I set my guideline down, I can still edit it by, you'll notice as I mouse up to it, it gets darker and then I can click on it and I can move that. So here I've set my guidelines, one's at zero, 10, 20, 30. So I've made them 30 millimeters apart. And I could use that, therefore, to size this embroidery to fit those two sides. So um, basically, I could just resize my embroidery until it fit within that guideline. And then maybe I want to do I don't know, copy and paste and put the new one and, and make sure that they all fit into that, um, into the same guidelines. Now, the other thing is, I have that ability into the view drop down menu to modify those guidelines. So now that I've created two guidelines, you can see here that I've got one that's set at a 30 and one that's set at 0 0.1. So it's almost exactly on zero. Um, you could do things like change the position. So if I didn't want it at one, maybe I wanted it to be at, um, I don't know, minus 10. I'll say okay. So it moved it down to the minus because it's below zero, 10. So now I have a 40 millimeter distance in between my two guidelines. And you can create guidelines on the opposite ruler as well. You can have as many guidelines as you want in your design. Um, and this is your ability to edit them under the view drop down menu, guidelines. So now you can see that I have four guidelines created and I could change their size or their XY um, coordinates. Um, you can lock them so that they're no longer selectable or editable so that they won't get moved on you. Um, you could delete them. So if I said, well, you know, I don't need this guideline, I can just delete that one or I could delete them all. And it will be rem remove all my guidelines, which is fine. I could also add a circular guideline. So instead of having um, a straight one, I can create basically a circle and then that becomes my a guideline in the design. So depending on what you want to use a guideline for, you have the ability to add them. So it's under the view drop down menu and it's called guidelines. And that's where you can modify them. If you want to create a rec like a straight one, you just click on your ruler and drag to bring it into your workspace. So that's how you can create your own guidelines. Also under the view drop down menu is the option to turn on your crosshair. And basically what this does is it 
it gives a big green crosshair which follows my mouse and see wherever I go that crosshair goes and this is a bit of a throwback to some of the earlier days of digitizing for me I know when I learned to digitize and I used a digitizing tablet and I had a, a multi button puck that I used to move around on my tablet on my screen I used to have a crosshair that would follow so it was, instead of a mouse with an arrow pointing, I had a giant crosshair. And so I guess that's just a little bit of that. Um, it really makes it easier for you to see exactly where you are. I guess it's just um, another visual opportunity that you have to control. So that's again under the view drop down menu. If you don't like the crosshair, you just click on it again and it takes it away. So also under the view drop down menu, you've got change fabric. And if I open that up, you can see in here that I could choose from you know a list of different types of fabrics and so if we choose burlap and say okay it will basically put behind my design that particular type of fabric and so you can have any kind of fabric that you want from you know quite a list of different types of fabrics that are available and here whenever there's a little plus that means there's more so embroidery ultralight gives me these fabric choices this is embroidery smooth gave me these so if you choose denim you can have denim if you'd want to choose the fleece then you can have fleece or flannel and whatever you choose that's what's going to go on your screen as your backdrop as your sorry as your fabric setting and so one more thing under the view drop down menu and that is the backdrop properties and when we talk about the backdrop properties basically um, if you remember when we talked about the sequence manager about how you got um, an image of your design um, and that image can be controlled you can have it um, your your embroidery could automatically snap to that you can make it selectable or have it shown when you're in 3d preview because currently when I go to 3d preview that image um, goes away you can have it be visible or not visible and have it use the interpolation which uh, I can't say I'm 100% familiar with that term, but the concept is you can control your image map, your, your background. So let me just show you what I'm talking about. If I turn the preview for 3D off, this is what we're talking about here because I had modified the size and position of those stars, but the image map, that the, the, the icon of my original design, which came in when I created the design, it's still shown here in my um, remember it's the one that comes at the very beginning of your um, sequence list so what that says is if I go under view drop down menu backdrop properties I can actually make that to be selectable and when I say okay now I can actually go in and select that um, image map and move it if I want to or resize it so that's what the backdrop properties I guess is really what it's called your backdrop properties and that image in your backdrop properties you have the ability to have some control over it and things like the brightness of it and um, you know the contrast or whatever so that's a quick review of the options under the view drop down menu now I guess before I finish there are a couple of other things so you have your toolbars and this is basically a turn on off so right now um, if I wanted to, I could turn off a toolbar so my standard toolbar is checked off. If I just click this again, the standard toolbar has gone away. And if I come to my view drop down menu and go to toolbars, you can see that it's just simply unchecked. And if I check it again, click on it a second time, it adds the toolbar back to my menu. So that's how you can see what toolbars are turned on and off. And same thing with the roll up menus. Um, remember I had my object properties roll up menu, my sequence manager property um, roll up menu and my transform. I looked at those three together in a previous segment, um, but I haven't shown the image map segment um, roll up menu yet. And if I wanted to, I could turn that on. And you can see that that's found here. And basically the image map, um, I'll, I'll create a separate segment for this and talk about the image map but that's how you would turn it on and off is under your view drop down menu so I'll come back and touch on the image map and yeah and then you have your status bars checked off and again that's down here at the bottom if I turn that off it simply goes away I no longer have a status bar at the bottom and if I go to view status bar 
turn it back on and it's at the bottom and it just gives you information about your design size um, number of stitches and that sort of thing so that's my segment on using the view drop down menu in this segment we're going to take a look at the layout drop down menu and that's found up here at the top of your workspace and when I select the layout drop down menu you can see that there's two main options one is array and the second one is a two-point copy and so we'll look at both I'll start with the array and what we can see here is we have two different options basically we have a rectangular array and a circular array so I will look at both now what this means is we've got a, a single star as our design and a rectangular array gives me the ability to control the number of copies horizontally and the number of copies vertically so why don't I change the number of horizontal copies to be three so we'll get three stars wide by two stars tall and I've got my spacing set between my horizontal copies at two millimeters but I have no space set between my vertical copies and you also have options in here to keep the colors together and to clone the objects if possible and I have both of those selected so I'll say okay and right away you can see oh, there's a little bit of space between my horizontal copies no space between the vertical copies and if I zoom out you'll see um, I'll just zoom out a little bit better that I got one two three wide by one two tall so that was the array we created and you can actually continue to make an array um, so now we have six stars if I chose layout array and did it again and maybe you want to set so right now we have three wide if I make three more copies we would end up with nine wide and we have two tall if I make two more copies that would give me eight tall so basically if I say okay you'll see here we end up with a larger amount of stars and if I count it's one two three four five six seven eight nine wide by four tall so that's the idea of creating a, a rectangular array it's easy way to duplicate your designs over and over now uh, perhaps what I'll do is use undo and go back to a single star and this time we'll take a look at the layout array and we'll go to the circular array and you'll notice right away it tells me that the rotation center of the selection must be different now what that means is um, I'll just close that and take a little bit closer look at our star so when you select an object and I'll go um, select all and if I wanted to I could rotate this object and when I rotate it's based upon a rotation center and that is found right here and I can actually move that in other words just to demonstrate I can rotate this star by clicking on a corner and rotating and it rotates around this center point now I'm going to use undo to put that back if I move the rotation point to let's say be right here and then rotate see it rotates around that point Now I'm gonna say undo again click off now what I wanted to do is show how I could make this star repeat around a circle so I'm gonna select the star and I'm gonna move that rotation point and what I'm gonna do is actually move it down below the star so that it were rotating around this is the rotation point now if I choose layout and array and then choose the circular array see now the tool is available to me and so you have several settings in here the first one is gonna be um, you've got this little dial and I've got it set to make my circle go all the way around notice I can click and drag on this to say well Jay I only want my circular array to be maybe half a circle so it starts at 90 ends at 271 and I can move the start or the end of this line and then I get to set the angle and the step count and those are basically set so if I change my angle my step count will change accordingly so if I change the angle from 10 to let's say I don't know 20 it changed my step count to 8 so that means I have a new star going every 20 degrees and it'll take eight stars to create this half a circle I'll say OK and so you can see there what I've got now a couple things of note I had only selected the blue fill and not both objects and therefore my array is only half of that um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say undo and this time I'm gonna use the select all tool 
and I'll move my rotation point down a little further like this. Now I'm going to choose the layout option, an array, circular array, and we'll do the full circle. So I'll make my array fill a whole circle and I'll change my step angle to be, let's say, 30. So that's going to make 12 stars in a circle. And when I say OK, so there you can see what it's done as it's duplicated both the fill and the outline of my star and it took 12 copies to make a full circle so those tools um, can be very helpful in creating new and interesting layouts in your designs so that's the rectangular and the circle array tool now I'm gonna use undo again and this time we're gonna take a look at a different option so under the layout menu we have the two-point copy and this is a, a way of making new copies of this star and being able to modify them at the same time and it's basically a, a two-step process when you choose this two-point copy so I'm gonna turn it on the first step is to define how you want to copy this star so for example um, sorry I need to turn it on two-point copy Oh, I need to select the star first. Sorry. And then choose layout and two point copy. And notice it gives me this little um, crosshair. And so the first step is to define how I want it to copy. In other words, if I wanted to always copy it across the top, um, I could put a, put a line. So I have to put in two points. So I'll put in a point here and I'll put in a point here. Now I can make my copies. So for example, wherever I draw a line, so I'll put a point down, and as I drag, notice that it makes, I can put it at any angle I want to, and the, the longer I make the line, the bigger it makes my new star. But notice that the star is being created underneath the line that I had created in the first step. So I could create a new star, just by clicking once, twice, and I can keep, I can make as many as I want. Click once, drag, click twice. Click once, drag, click twice. And as many times as I do this step, once, drag, click twice. Now when I right click, it lets go of the tool. So I'm gonna do that again. I'm just gonna choose undo, 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 undo. Right, there's my star, layout two-point copy. The first one is basically to create the directions. So for example, maybe this time I'd like to, to copy my star across its center. So I'm going to go one and two. Now I can create my new stars. One. See, now the, star, the new star is created across the center of the new star. One and two and you just every time it's one and two to create a new copy of that same shape and again if I want to be finished I right click to let go so that's how you can use the layout tool to create new layouts um, and new copies of your objects also found under the layout menu are some sequencing options like to front to back or one step forward or one step backwards and what that means is, so for example, these stars are going to appear in the object in the order that I created them. Um, but they've been kept with their colors sorted together because if you remember, we'd had that as one of our check boxes. So basically it's gonna do all the light blue stars and then it's gonna do all the dark blue outlines. Well, if I want to, I can select one of these light blue stars and go to the layout and ask it to move that to the front, which would make it be on the very top of everything. So notice what it did. Now this star has been moved after all the dark blue stars. See that? So the idea is um, the front is the bottom of your sequence tray and the back is the top of your sequence tray. And you can select any one um, object or multiple objects of your design and change where they sew by moving them either to the front, to the back, or one step forward or one step backwards. And the last option just simply says add new objects to the end. And that's where you can clearly see all the new objects were added at the end of my 
design. And as you add more new objects, they get added to the end as well. So that's the layout toolbar and how you can use the layout toolbar to create um, rectangular, circular arrays, and two-point copies. In this segment, I'm going to review the options under the Stitches drop-down menu. And to help prepare for that segment, I've just simply opened up a JEF embroidery design that I'd previously created. And the reason why I wanted to have a JEF file is because um, a lot of the options under the Stitches drop-down menu relate to making changes to existing embroidery designs. So let's go to the Stitches drop-down menu and just review our options here. So we've got Remove Small Stitches, we've got Divide, we've got Auto Density, we've got Convert Step to Satin, we've got an Edit Step Pattern option, and we have Replace and Move Outline. Now these last two I might leave until I start um, showing on the left hand menu how to actually select stitches and then modify them but the rest of these will be fine for what we've learned so far and so what I'll do to get started is I'm just gonna choose the remove small stitches option and what happens is you get a window that comes up and it gives you a stitch range so small stitches from 0.0, .0 millimeters in other words there's no movement at all between two needle penetrations and you can set the, the longer distance. So here I've got it set at 0 0.04. So that means any stitches that are 0 0.04 of a millimeter or smaller would be removed from this design. Now, before I run this, I'm just going to point out this design has 28,570 stitches. So if I say OK, it goes ahead and processes it. And now, just taking a look at the bottom, I can see that this design has 27,726 stitches. So that's really a significant change, although this is a large design. Um, it took out, you know, quite a few stitches, all, all, I forget, almost 800 stitches or something like that that was removed from the design. Now, another option under the Stitches drop-down menu is called Divide. And perhaps I'll just explain what that means. So, for example, if I select this area of the design right here, and I'm going to zoom in on it, now notice how this satin column gets goes from kind of skinnier to gets wider and then wider until it gets to its widest point and it starts to get skinnier again. Well, perhaps you've got a design and you feel that the satin stitches are too long and you'd like to have them divided. And what it'll do is, so I have selected an area and before I use the tool, I think I'll also do one thing to help show this. Um, here on the standard toolbar, I have the ability to show the stitch marks. When I turn that on, you can see here how every single stitch of the design gets shown with a little circle. So those are the needle penetrations. So the idea is, I'm just going to zoom out a little bit, here as this design gets wider I want it to divide and so let's just confirm yes I have this area selected and I'm going to choose stitches and divide and it asks me you know from what length do I want to divide so we'll set it it's set right now at three millimeters so that means anything that's longer than three millimeters will get divided into two equal pieces because equal pieces is checked off so if I say okay and then um, I'll take a closer look here. If I just zoom in closely, you can see here, see, I'll use undo. That's how it was originally. And then with redo, you can see here that it added needle penetrations into this area here. So these stitches must be longer than that three millimeters. Not here though, they didn't, didn't add any there, but it split a few there and it didn't split any until I get, get got back down to this area and it split some here and you can see that there's some that were split over here as well so the idea is um, when you use divide there's another area down here that has some dividing on it um, the software is going to take a longer satin stitch and divide it in half alright now I'm gonna choose undo to put the design back to the way it was and the next option under Stitches drop-down menu is Auto Density. And the purpose of this, now let's just imagine that we selected a part of this design. So I'm going to select a portion of this scroll and move it over. 
And you can see it's not all the scroll. There were it did was divided into a couple pieces, but that doesn't matter. I just I want to make this area smaller. So I'm going to go ahead and decrease the size. Now, even though I decreased the size, all of the original stitches are still there. We haven't asked it to change the density. So that's where this tool comes in because you can see I I reduced the size of this for, you know, until maybe it's even half of its original size. So if I choose stitches and auto density apply and I take a closer look, you can see here that it it reduced the stitches to maintain the original density of them. So if I just choose undo, you can see how many more stitches there were. That was the the density that was for the original size and and so when I um, when I use wings modular to make size changes to stitch designs, designs that I didn't create that I just have a stitch file for, when I change the size, it does not change the number of stitches and it requires us to actually apply that. So it's called auto density apply. And it'll auto automatically adjust the density of those stitches. So that's the auto density option. And again, I'm just going to choose undo and undo a couple times until I put that back to where it belongs. And my design is unchanged. So the next option under the stitches um, drop down menu is called convert step to statin. And I don't often use the term step as much as I might call it a weave fill. Um, the idea of a step fill is the opposite of a satin fill. In other words, any area that's been filled in with needle penetrations, and you can call it a step stitch, you can call it a tatami stitch, you can call it weave fill. Um, what I'm going to do is just select a portion of this design. What did I get? So here's, here's the light blue fill from underneath this butterfly wing. We're going to zoom in. And here you can see clearly the the area is filled in with a weave fill or a step fill. Now, the ability to adjust that, so stitches and convert step to satin. It takes all those needle penetrations out and just leaves the needle penetrations on the outer edges and what you can see that's remaining in here is actually just the underlay that it was un untouched. I'm going to choose undo and undo. Maybe that's not an appropriate example of using it. Um, but for example, here's an area of the design, this um, bright pink area here has a small area, not too large, and it's been filled in with um, what looks like it was probably some sort of a split satin stitch. Now, if I use stitches and convert step to satin, you'll see that it just nicely cleans that up and makes it a satin stitch. So you can see where maybe you've taken a design and reduced its size, and now there's areas that were fill or were step, and you'd like to convert them to satin. So that's your option. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and, I guess, do undo to remove that and put it back. Now the next option um, under the stitches drop down menu is called edit the step pattern. And this is really quite interesting. I think maybe what I'll do is I, I will grab that blue light blue fill again and move it over here and zoom in so you can see the stitches and how they look. Now if I choose stitches and edit step pattern, what you can see here is the step pattern uh, designer and this is your ability to decide how many rows of step do you want in your step pattern. So um, if you want I think a nice sort of default one might have three rows, 0, 33, 66. But you can play with it. You could have four rows. You could make them sort of like equal widths. So what this is about, when it sews a piece of weave fill or a tatami or a step fill, the first row, the needle penetrations are set at a stitch length. So let's say it's a four millimeter stitch length. So it's four and it moves along the same line to the next one, four, and then along the next one for four. And when it makes the next row, it'll offset those stitches by a percentage. So if it's a four millimeter stitch length and you have four rows that are 25, 50, 75, and 100, let's say, then you're going to get um, 
each row will move will offset by one millimeter. So the idea is you can have five rows and you can adjust them. And notice here in this little preview box, I can see what that will look like. So if you wanted to, you could have um, any number of rows of offsets. And so what you can see here is I create the look of the pattern. And when I say OK, it actually edits that pattern in my weave fill. So you have the ability to edit the your step pattern and like I said you can have as many rows as you want and as many offsets as you want and when you say okay it will modify your step pattern so you can create any kind of piece of fill that you want and I thought that was a really interesting tool to have the edit step pattern it gives you a very visual look to how your stitches are going to be placed and if you decide you just want to go back to having three rows and you want them to be kind of at that default um, Let's see, usually you go 30, and then you can have the next one at 60, and the next one at 90, or whatever. Three, ro three equal rows like this gives a nice sort of smooth pattern to it. And that's what you'll get. So that's the um, segment about using the Stitches drop-down menu, and I will leave these two to come back to. In this segment, I'm going to take a look at the Tools drop-down menu, and Primarily, we're going to talk about creating um, cut work using the Veneri Cut. And so I've left the, this is the a Janome Jeff file that I had previously created and just simply opened it up in the Wings modular. And I guess the difference being if you're working on a Jeff design that we did not create using the um, Creative Drawing software, and yet you want to add some um, Venere cut to this design, some cut work, you have the ability to use the drawing tool under the tools menu to draw your own cut work shape. Now, looking at the design, it's not necessarily been a design that's been intended for cut work, but that doesn't mean you can't choose to add some. So for example, um, just looking at the design, looking at this little sort of area here that's sort of like a little circle that's nicely surrounded by satin stitches if I zoom in on that area I could imagine where we could remove the stitches inside of that area if that's what we wanted to do and um, so far every time we've talked about creating venere cut we've talked about selecting the existing object for embroidery and then choosing to apply a venere cut and I'll show that again but in this case there is no convenient option object that we could select and convert to be a venere cut so what we would need to do is we would need to draw the venere cut shape and that's where the tools drop down menu has this option for digitized venere cutting and when I choose that you'll notice that now my mouse has become um, a cross, a crosshair and basically what I need to do is draw that shape now I'll just go ahead and click points to draw and you'll notice that um, they come in straight, but they kind of they'll curve a little bit to match the shape that I'm drawing, kind of based upon the previous point. So as I'm putting these in, um, if I click and drag, just like in the Creative Drawing software, I can actually control the vectors to decide exactly what the curve of the shape is going to be. But basically, I just need to draw enough points now. When I get to the place here where I'm going to put my last point over top of my first point, it will automatically know that I've finished that shape. So I'm going to click that last point now. And then I can right click to let go and I'm done creating the shape. And you can see here that the software has created a new object which is going to be um, for use with the Venere cutting needles. Now. Um, that object would still need to be sequenced. You see it's at the bottom of my sequence manager here. And so that's another example of using the layout tools and say, well, I would like to move this to the back. In other words, I want it to sew first. So now that venere cut step has been moved to be the first piece of embroidery in our embroidery design um, as opposed to the last where I, where I had created it. So that's the tool, and, and generally speaking, if you want to create a hole anywhere in, in any design, you could just shoot, choose tools and digitize, digitize venere cutting, and you go ahead and you draw yourself 
your shape. And when you're done, it creates the steps in your sewing sequence for the, the multicolored steps of the needles. So we have that tool under the Tools drop-down menu. And there's also an Options box here, but I'll come back to that in a minute. I just wanted to continue looking at um, creating the venere cut. So this is when you're going to need to digitize your own shape. But a lot of times, you would have created your own design using um, the Creative Drawing software. And in that case, just as an example, I'll go back to that star that I've been looking at so often in this demonstration. So here I have a design that I created in the Creative Drawings, and it simply has two objects, a light blue weave fill and a dark blue outline. Now, if we decided, actually, rather than weave fill for this blue center, maybe we'd like to have it as a whole, or in other words, a cutwork. So I can actually select that by, well, easiest way is probably just to click on it in the Sequence Manager, which highlights the object. And then while my mouse is over top of the object, I right click. And that gives me a secondary menu. And you'll notice throughout the um, Creative Drawings and Wings Modular software, there's often a second menu or a right click menu. And in this case, the right click menu, well, it's got some options for like the sewing sequence. But in this case, it's the Change to Venere Cut option that I was looking for. And so rather than having to draw this shape, I can simply select that background and have it change to Venere Cut. And so now we can see that it's created the Venere Cut um, step in the design, and it's no longer filled in in blue as it had previously been, and it's been made to work with the cutting needles. So there's really two ways to create a Venere Cut um, portion of an embroidery design. One is to, like I just showed, to select an area of a design, and then convert it to Venere Cut using the right click or the secondary click option. Or the op other way is to go about using the tools menu and actually choosing to digitize your own Venere Cut um, shape. And in that case, you actually have to draw all of the points for the shape yourself. And that's basically what I'm doing here is just drawing points. And it kind of snaps nicely to the shape, which is helpful. And yeah, so one, two more points. And then right click to finish. And so there you can see um, I created a, the first venere cut by just simply converting the weave fill to be a venere cut, drops all the weave fill, converts it to venere cut. Or you have the option of digitizing it yourself using the tools in the drop down menu. Now, when you do create a venere cut, and this design will have actually two segments because I have venere cut sewing first then a satin stitch border, and then it's going to come back and do another venere cut again. So obviously that's not an appropriate um, sewing sequence for a design. Um, it's not that the sequence is wrong, but it doesn't make any sense to sew this satin stitch border and then come later afterwards and cut a hole down the center of it. Well, who's to say that's wrong? Maybe there's a, an interesting technique that we haven't discovered. Um, but what I wanted to show is if I look at the print preview, here you can see the sewing order of the design. So here's the first venere cut, one, two, three, four. Then I've got that satin stitch, and then a second venere cut, one, two, three, four. So whether you create the um, venere cut by right clicking and converting an object to venere cut, or whether you use the tool drop down menus and digitize that shape yourself, the end result is the same. That it, um, the software knows to take that shape and convert it into the four venere cut needles. Now, um, the venere cut needles, as if we look, you know, closely at these at the print sheet, it shows you which needle is which. So they're color coded, and they're also coded by the degree that's on them. So that's why to go around the star, it takes all four needles because there's four different needles, and each one has um, a different degree of blade that sews and then therefore cuts out that design. So literally to sew this design you would have um, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine color stops to sew out and you would have to change the cutting needle for each time it did. So yeah that's a little bit more about using the Venere cut tool. So 
Um, originally, we talked about just converting the Veneri cut, and this time we looked at under the Tools drop down menu how you can actually create and digitize the shape yourself right here in the Wings Modular software. In this segment, I'm going to take a look at the General Options settings, and they're found under the Tools drop down menu. So when you choose that option, uh, a box opens up, and there are several tabs under this box Display tab, Printing, general, 3D properties, your key, colors, and workspace. And I'll go through and explain uh, as much as I understand. I don't profess to know every detail about all of these options. At least I haven't had the opportunity to learn them all. And I believe that if I needed to, I would be able to get that help um, either from Artistic Sewing Suite or um, just from my online manual where I often refer to but I'll, ref I'll, I'll highlight the things that I do understand and think are valuable to learn about. So basically the monitor width, this is important. If you use a widescreen monitor, you want to make sure that your software knows the size of your monitor so that everything on your screen is displayed proportionately. In other words, is your grid a square? Um, you know, is the shape of your square a square or does it get stretched? And by um, setting the size of your monitor by either using auto detect or choosing from one of the presets or typing in the visible area you will get um, everything to display in proportion. Um, also on this area here we have the um, English language choice or what language you would like to choose. There are several languages available and when you choose a different language, you need to reload, in other words, close your software and reopen it again for the changes to take effect. And um, I believe if you change the language to a different language, that it will change the um, text on all of your drop down menus and your tools. Um, but I don't believe that it changes the online manual. I'm pretty sure that the, the, the online manual is just available in English. Under the printing tab, you have the default fonts that will be displayed when you print your templates and the default size of the fonts, so you can change those things. Um, you can change the resolution or the dots per inch for when you print out. And it says my company name here is Print Out by Wings Modular. I could change this to say Print Out by Trevor Conquergood or whatever you would like your um, printouts to say. And it, it's checked off to auto fit in print preview, so that's fine. Um, under the general tab, well, it's asking me what kind of embroidery floppy diskette I use, and I actually don't use one, so I could choose none. But if you still had um, an A drive or a B drive for your floppy diskette, this will help your software know where to find it. Um, I'm not exactly sure about some of these options, but the undo levels, well, you can set the number of times that you can choose to say undo, 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 undo if you're wanting to go backwards in your designs. And it also is set here for to auto back up every one operation. So that means my, my design will never be uh, far from being backed up. Every time I make a change, it gets backed up. You can choose your measurement system. Again, it's, it's either metric or imperial. Uh, and if I was to change it from metric to imperial, I would need to close the software and then restart it for that change to take effect. Under the 3D properties, um, I haven't had an opportunity to really go through this. When I installed my software, um, the Direct 3D was the sort of default choice and it just simply worked for me, but I presume if you had any issues with getting that to work with your computer that this is going to be a way that you can go in and choose the other 3D option or make other changes so that it will function for you um, appropriately. The key, well this has to do with your security device and basically it's showing me here the levels of the program that I have available to me and um, it tells me here my old parts number and the reason this is here is if you actually you can actually receive new functions from the Artistic Sewing Suite, um, basically to add new functions to your software. And that can be done by codes, which you would then update, put into here, and choose update. And it would then award you um, the new functionality that you had either purchased or been given by the um, software developers. So this is a little bit about your software and your security suite, or your security key, your dongle. Colors. I really like this one. Um, basically, it shows here 
um, the colors that I have in my design. So just as an example, when a design selected, these are the colors on light backgrounds that's going to select it in green. It'll show it in green. On dark backgrounds, it will show it in this sort of orange color. And I could choose from any color I wanted to. So if I would rather it to be displayed in um, on dark backgrounds in a you know dark pink, then I could make that change. And you have the same option for all these different um, types of embroidery situations. So what color would you like your grid to be? On light backgrounds, I have a sort of honey colored grid. On dark backgrounds, I have my grid set for pink. But if you'd rather have a red background on dark, you can make that change. So your guidelines, you can set the colors of your guidelines. You can set the temp, the color of all these different things, your crosshair. And so this is your ability to customize, I guess, how the software is going to appear to you. Um, one more thing on the workspace. So one of the options in the Wings Modular is when you hit your space bar, things will disappear. And so, for example, um, whatever you have checked off in here will not disappear when I hit my space bar. So right now, you'll notice my standard toolbar up at the top is not checked off. So if I say OK, and then I'm just going to hold my space bar, or I'm going to click my space bar. Notice what it did. It just hid all of my toolbars and basically only left what I decided. So um, my image map is still available and the file drop down menus are still available. Now if I hit spacebar again, it brings all my toolbars back. So it's a nice way, I guess, when you're digitizing to clean up the clutter. Um, but under the tools and options menu, I would be able to say, well, actually, I really want my standard toolbar to always remain as well. So now if I say OK and then hit the spacebar, the standard toolbar still remains. So that's what that's about. You have the ability to control under the workspace which tools will be remain um, on your screen when you press your spacebar. So that's um, an overview of the general options in the Wings Modular. And I'm sorry I'm not an expert on all of those functions, but um, certainly if you need help finding them, you're welcome to ask me, although I'm sure that the people at Artistic Sewing Suite would be um, happy to assist in any questions you may have. In this segment, I'm going to take a look at the window drop down menu. And so when I select that window drop down menu, you'll see there's several options and they all relate to viewing the designs that you currently have open and are working on at this time. And so what I can see, if I look at the bottom, I have two designs that are currently open. One of them is untitled and that's the star that we're, we've been working on. Um, the other design that I have open is this butterfly corner and this design here um, it shows me the full path to where it's been saved in my computer and I could switch between these two designs by simply clicking on design number two and it will then pop over and show me that design in my workspace so I can switch back and forth between the designs just by clicking on them there. Now the other things under the window drop down menu relate to um, how you can view those designs. So for example, you could have them tiled vertically or horizontally or cascade. And why don't we go ahead and take a look at that. So tile vertical will show the two designs here. I'll just have to pop them both up like this. Tool, windows, vertical, like this. It'll show both designs side by side. If I choose window and tile horizontal, then it gonna sh it's going to show the two designs one on top of each other. And if I choose um, Cascade, it will give us a box for each design. And then you could basically click on the box to see the contents of what's inside. So it's really all just different ways of looking at the designs. If I choose All Iconic, basically what it does is puts them all into very small little um, icons. And then it would be up to me to restore them up to their size like this. So I could have all my designs sort of hidden, just small along the bottom, and then basically minimize them and zip them up and down as I needed to. So these are different ways you can look at them. Um, one more option is the active designs box. And when I open this up, it'll give me more of a visual of, oh, I have this design open, and I have this design open. And it even gives me some options like printing, saving, write it to a floppy, or close the design. So if we decided we were done with this butterfly, we could choose to close it if we wanted to. So that's um, the window drop-down menu and the different ways that you can browse and find the designs that you have currently open in your software. 
In this segment, I'm going to take a look at the drop down menu for help. And when I open up the help drop down menu, I've got three options we've got the contents, we've got the show help on, and then we have a boat. So um, I'll go ahead and talk about a boat first. When I choose on a boat, it's going to open up a window and it's basically going to tell me what version of the software that I'm using and it tells me things like my serial number so this is your ability to know if somebody wants to know what version of the software you're using then you can go to help and about and that will be your most accurate way of knowing exactly what version of the software you're currently using now also under the help menu we have contents and we have show help on now the show help on when I choose that it basically gives me the little question mark over my mouse and now if I was to want to learn something so for example I'm gonna to come to the paste uh, tool and click on it and what happens I'll just move this into my screen my view it brings up the online manual and defaults to the explanation of how to use the word paste and so maybe that's not a very exciting um, option why don't we try it again help show help on and this time we'll choose um, one of these specialized tools on the editing menu over here so I'm going to choose this one and it shows me that this is the split objects tool and it gives me a description of how to use it so that's one of the things that's really great about the show help on um, but at the same time if you just use the help menu and just bring up the contents it brings up the same basically it's a digital user manual for the software and it's browsable first of all by contents so I can expand this and I can go through the legend of the different chapters and find the different information and if I wanted to see this I click on it and it shows me the information over here you also have an index that you can go through and find um, you know specific terms and definitions that you'd like to look up you can also search for a word so if I wanted to learn more about for example the um, Veneri cut I'll type in the word Veneri list topics it shows me all of the topics all of the documents that have the word Veneri in them and I can double click on this and have that shown in the contents window over here and you can create your own favorites and that basically are the things that you found uh, that you've used the most often and and maybe want to come back to so yeah and you have the ability to print these pages um, so yeah that's the wings modular online manual that comes with the software when you install it and that's a little bit more about the help menu and what the contents are under the help menu